Um, it's wonderful to be in Strathpeffer. Um, when I first came to Scotland, uh, me and my wife, and she was my girlfriend at the time, her aunt lives over in Strathpeffer, and we came here. Uh, and it's such a beautiful place, so we went to the spa, I remember drinking the, drinking the water. And um, uh, that was in, back in 93. And when I heard that this event was in the Strathpeffer Pavilion, I was very excited. I actually thought I was going to be up on stage, though, because I think Proclaimers had played up on that stage. And the Saw Doctors and uh, the Kaiser Chiefs recently as well. So that was quite um, uh, inspiring. Um, I apologise in advance, I have just got over the flu, and so if I cough my way through this presentation, uh, I apologise, and it will probably be picking it up on the, on the microphone as well. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Oh, that changed. Oh, there's a picture of the Proclaimers that I found. There we go, there's the Proclaimers, just to prove that they played here. Sunshine on Leith. Um, so what I really wanted to do um, in my presentation was to give you some practical advice, some things that you can go away and do in your businesses, if you like, and explore some ideas and some digital ideas and give you some case studies um, that has, uh, has happened uh, uh, previously. And to think of them as jumping off points. Where can you go from here? This is an idea, I can go away, back to my business, I can explore this, uh, and where can I then take that on um, by speaking to Highlands Islands Enterprise or people like Rene, who can help you then to take those, those forward. And usually, um, that might have already been done, but usually when I do this, these uh, presentations, I'm, I'm before lunch. But I think this is twice now Interface put me on after lunch. I'm not too sure whether that's because uh, there's less people here for me to um, insult. But um, I usually ask people to keep their mobiles on, which is rare in these sort of uh, events, but maybe if they're on silent, that would be great. So I think this is, um, uh, I took this from the uh, Tourism Scotland Strategy 2020. I don't know how many of you have read this uh, exciting document. Um, of course, we know that our customers are, and partners are increasingly using digital tech. Um, and again, it's throughout that life cycle of the visit. So it's, it's at the beginning when they're researching and booking online, and then it's in the middle when they're using these uh, trail apps. And, and that's been covered previously, so I don't want to labour on that. But I guess what's our, our role as businesses or organisations? I think it's to support and facilitate that journey as much as we can and add value to that overall customer experience. Um, but not taking the, ball, the eye off the ball in terms of our operation. And I think that's, if that's one message that I can get over to you today, is that we need to remember this, all this digital technology, is an, it's an enabler. It's there to help us, it's there to complement. But it should be fitting seamlessly into our overall business strategy and operation. You know? And I think that uh, people can get, we can get you know, two heads up. We are not, well, a, a large selection of you in the audience are not digital media companies your visitor attractions or your bread and breakfast and things like that. So it's, you know, it's more about the quality service and the customer experience than it is. And I think we need to make sure that we, we, there's a recognition that this technology is an, is an enabler for us to do that. Because I guess most of you sitting out there are thinking, how can I make more money? I guess most of you out there are saying, how can I stay, <laughs> stay in business? How can I make my business survive? How can I get more people to come, new visitors to come and stay in my area, in my bed and breakfast, at my visitor attraction, at my museum? How can I increase those frequency of visits and then increase the spend per head while they're here? And this is me with my business background hat on. And today, more than ever, the customers are playing an active role in that digital marketing process. Your customers are now not just your consumers, but they're creating that content, they're owning that content, and they're sharing that content with their other people, with their, with their, with their friends as well. Um, I'm really annoyed because a while ago I saw um, a presentation, and it was on YouTube, and I can't find it anymore, but it was a presentation by the Vice President of Marketing for Coca-Cola. Uh, and if anyone finds it, if they could email me it, it would be, it would be wonderful. But she gave a presentation um, to, her, uh, to employees of Coca-Cola, and uh, in the, during the presentation she showed a video clip of a young girl who was sitting in her bedroom with a Coke bottle, and some of you might have seen it, and she opens the lid of the Coke bottle and music comes out. And then she puts the lid back on and the music stops. And she does it again, she opens the Coke bottle. And, then and the vice president of Coca-Cola, female, I can't remember her name, she showed that video. And after she showed it, she said, she had to get permission from the girl to show that video. Because that girl owned that content that she created. And she was the vice president of Coca-Cola. And I think that shows that our customers are now owning the content and they're talking about you and all you can do is manage that, particularly on things like TripAdvisor, which was, which was mentioned before. If anyone finds that video, please send it to me. 
So this is really just covering some of the simple things. And again, I don't want to labor the point because again, when you go after lunch, you realize that this, a lot of stuff has, has been said here. But I think we all know that mobile internet usage is projected to overtake desktop internet usage by next year. Um, and we know that Apple and Android are now representing around about 75% of the smartphone market. And so website needs to be optimized for mobile, for mobile web. Most of your customers will now be going, looking at your website using a mobile phone or a mobile um, tablet. Uh, and so we need to go back to our business and make sure that some of our, that our website is optimized for mobile web. But it's not just optimized for mobile web, it needs to be interesting, there needs to be good content on it. Nothing worse than a, than a boring website. And it also needs to be found. And again, I, it was interesting to hear that they're doing some search engine optimization workshops, uh, which I encourage you to go to if you want to, or want to be found. Um, we, know, we know about social media, um, you have the Facebooks, the Twitters, the YouTubes, are we using these as effectively as, as, as we can at the moment. Um, and what are you doing about capturing your visitors' information? Um, do you do it? Do you ask your customers' opinions at the moment? Um, are we connecting with our local partners? A lot of us is find it quite difficult to have an impact when we're working in silos. And so it's quite important to maybe go and speak to your neighbors and work cooperatively as much as you can. And I think destination management organizations have a job to do and Cooperative Scotland have a job to do to make sure that um, we're not, you know, if, if, we're going to, if we're going to develop an app, it's, cost, it's, uh, it's costly. It takes time, it takes money. And so how can we do that and leverage uh, partners uh, to refer to each other? And what sort of loyalty awards are we using at the moment? Uh, are we using loyalty awards? Is there a way that we can make uh, people come back again or refer them to the business and they refer them back to you, uh, to, an, to another business? So that's some basics. And I just want to go through a couple of different um, ideas. And again, this is, this is what I call sort of ju the jumping off points, if you like, if you like and ways in which um, the travel and tourism industry can interact uh, and things that you can maybe go and do back in your businesses. So SMS, uh, a text, short messaging service is what it is. Um, you know, there's no doubt that some of these uh, rich mobile applications um, that we have, um, high-end customers have these latest Galaxy uh, handsets. I know there's, I've seen a lot of them in the room and the, the iPhone 6s and things like that. Um, but there's still a lot of our customers just don't have these phones. And there are four billion mobile phones at the moment. A billion of them in the world are smartphones. Uh, uh, three billion of them um, aren't. Uh, they're SMS enabled, so they can get text. And I think there's things that we can do back in our businesses um, around text. And there are really good case studies of how texts and SMS um, has been used. It's, it's ubiquitous. Every handset is SMS enabled. Um, vast majority of our users, particularly some of the the elderly users, uh, particularly the aunt up, uh, up at Strathpeffer there, uh, my wife's aunt, she's great at texting. And she, she doesn't have a smartphone, but she, she knows how to text and she's comfortable with texting. Um, so it's uh, incredibly flexible texting. Um, uh, despite being a relatively simple messaging format, there's a huge range of SMS services that we can use to engage with our customers. Uh, there's a massive variety of, uh, of cases. Let me give you some. Uh, one of the clearest applications for SMS is ticketing. Uh, and it's been adopted by a number of players, whether it's train tickets, bus tickets, uh, plane tickets, event tickets, events to come to Strath, uh, Strathpeffer Pavilion. Um, and you can use an industry standard barcode reader when you come through the door. You send a text and you've got your barcode and you just swipe it as you come in um, with regular scanning equipment. Authentication. Uh, how many people of uh, banks use this sometimes now? When you're going onto your bank, um, they'll sometimes send you a code uh, back to your phone, and then you have to put in the four-digit code to, to say who you are. I mean, these, these phones that we have now are very personal devices. Uh, mine is very, very, very personal to me. Um, and, and we're finding now that this, uh, a, a one-time password will be sent to my phone for me to authenticate who I am. And again, um, it's a cost-effective way for, for us to be able to authenticate. And I think one of the most powerful um, SMS uh, uh, uses, in addition to ticketing, um, is um, uh, consumers can use uh, SMS in the travel industry for alerting. And this can be as straightforward as, as messaging a confirmation of uh, a tourist hotel booking. 
or letting them know what the current weather locations are like, uh, the weather is like in the location. Um, so it's about giving uh, alerts and giving uh, information wherever the customer is located. Um, and companies like Text Tank, you might want to write some of these down because you might want to explore some of these. Text Tank, Text Magic, Text Marketing, Club Texting. Um, these are all solution providers uh, for text. Uh, they make SMS campaign solutions and the setup process relatively easily. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that if you, uh, if you drop me an email. Of course, the other thing that text, that we can use text is for the short codes. And most of you would probably come across short codes when you get a text from someone and then it says, uh, uh, text this word to this number. And then it says, if you want to unsubscribe, press stop. And sometimes we can get an annoyed by these. Um, but uh, a mobile keyword uses an SMS marketing campaign, uh, which is a one word phrase that identifies a product or service. Um, so a typical campaign would be that you would text uh, a keyword or phrase. So you might um, text pavilion to one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and, and for that, I would get entered into a draw for tickets to come and see the proclaimers, um, for example, or get a coupon for a free drink at, at uh, half time. Um, they would then have my number. They could then remind me about the event. They could then also tell me of other events that are coming on. And they start to uh, have a database of mobile numbers that they can then um, um, use campaigns for. And the thing with that is it puts me in control because I can press stop and it stops. It takes me off their database. And so there's a certain amount of, of control by the person that's joining because you can unsubscribe. And that sort of level of control is, is a new uh, emerging mobile culture um, that is coming about. And with these SMX, uh, SMS um, marketing, um, the impact is high. I believe there's a 90% read rate and a 25% uh, response rate, which is a lot higher than email marketing, which I believe that's about 90% to 24% open rate, just opening the email around 20% of people is very, very good with email. And you compare that with mobile's 95% read rate. And maybe we should be looking a little bit closer at SMS uh, campaigns. I've got a, a website here called Incentivized. Um, rather than go through lots of case studies, um, go and have a look at that website. It's a company that, that works with companies and they've got loads of case studies about um, SMS um, campaigns. This was touched upon before and it's something that I'd like to touch upon again uh, and it's game gamification. Uh, it's most often defined as the use of game mechanics for non-game applications. So in other words, businesses are making their websites and their applications feel a bit less like sales, like transactions, and more like games. And Foursquare is a, is a typical sort of proving that gamification can grab and hold on to people's attentions. People love playing games. Um, but a tourism organisation's geared up for this sort of gamification. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it because time won't allow me, but um, Google uh, Ingress. I-N-G-R-E-S-S. Uh, Ingress is um, Google's latest, uh, well, they had Google Earth and they had uh, uh, street maps and things like that. But Ingress is, is the latest massive multiplayer online role-playing game that Google are developing. Um, and it's, it's gamification and augmented reality on steroids. Uh, it's coming. It's coming to, to this country eventually. It's in beta test at the moment. Um, and basically it's like, has anybody, uh, maybe we're not geeks, um, but has anybody seen or heard about a World of Warcraft? It's basically a virtual world where people go and fight each other and fight baddies, you know, and, and it's, a, it's an enormous global phenomenon. They're taking that type of gaming application and they put it into the real world. So people will be able to uh, come into Inverness or go into Glasgow and they'll be able to have these uh, massive multiplayer games uh, in uh, actual cities, basically. And again, it's sort of merging the virtual world and, and the real world. Um, I won't dwell on it. I probably don't know enough about it to talk about it, but go and have a look at it um, because uh, it's something, again, it's the, it's the future um, of uh, tourism. So now I'm going to mix the two, gamification with um, uh, SMS text messaging. 
Um, and this is a mobile app um, which users use to explore a city. But they use it, um, and it's sort of like a city trail, if you like. Um, but their guides are fairly unconventional. They jumble up short stories, uh, and then they uh, ask the person that's going around the city to solve a puzzle. And that puzzle, the answer to that puzzle, you then have to text, and they send you back to say whether it's right or not. Um, so this is uh, Weiwei. Wei. Another game um, that was developed, um, and this was Tourism Island, uh, had a, an island town game. Um, and this was on Facebook. They decided to put it on Facebook. And this went live at St. Patrick's Day in 2011. They had 9,000 likes. Um, and it was uh, played by over 100,000 people in the first five days. Um, so this is something that maybe a destination management organisation could do or a, a, co a cooperative. Um, it was described as the first social game ever to be created by a tourist board. Um, and in May this year, the game had been played by uh, 215,000 players. Um, and for those of you that have ever played uh, Farmville, um, the game's based around creating your own island town, which you build up from achievements within the game economy. The, ga the game had its own sort of economy. Um, and some of the achievements, you got points for when you travel to different places, different destinations around Ireland, if you carried out simple tasks, um, they unlocked more elements of the economy. Um, but it had a social dimension because you could invite your friends. You could invite your friends to hold a party in a pub that you were building or to organise an event uh, in, a, in a pavilion or in a, in a, in a place. Um, I think uh, the, the Tourism Island, the first uh, uh, national tourist board in the world to launch this type of social game uh, that tapped into the huge popularity of games um, that we're finding now. So that's a little bit about gamification. Um, I just want to talk to you now about GPS, um, Global Positioning Systems. Um, this is relatively old technology, um, but it's continuously being upgraded and incorporated into lots of new business ventures um, that are, are reshaping the way businesses are, are, are being conducted. Um, and I think we just need to look at the tourism industry to see that this technology is here to stay. Um, and that's because for a lot of GPS, or for nearly all GPS, you don't need an internet ac access for it to operate. It works fairly well in, in unconnected areas or, or uh, areas of uh, a low bandwidth. Um, but first to understand why there's this growth in technology, let's understand what the technology was. It's, it was for those of you that don't know, it was developed by the United States Department of Defense. It's a satellite-based satellite navigation system. Um, and it can usually pinpoint your location, or my mobile's location, within about 10 to 15 meters uh, with some amount of accuracy. And it uses uh, signals from three or more satellites to triangulate where you are. Uh, and it can also track your speed of journey time. So it can, it can take me here, and then if I walk over there, it will take me there, and it will know how long it's taken for me to get from here to to there so it can track me and it can track the speed of my journey. Um, there were 30, around 30 of these GPS satellites flying around at altitudes of about 20,000 uh, kilometres and they're all emitting very high frequency radio signals. So how can we use GPS in our businesses? Um, well, uh, there's a company in Canada, in the Canadian Rockies, um, using it for transportation. Um, they're called Gypsy Guide, G-Y-P-S-Y. Um, worth uh, having a look at. Um, and they play very interesting and entertaining commentary and stories automatically as you approach different places. And they've tied into car rental businesses. And so they basically have uh, a, a mobile receiver uh, and stories and facts and tips and advice just triggers as you're going around. Um, but there's stuff going on in Scotland that I think we, we previously spoke about. And I think some of the things that they were doing uh, in Edinburgh was also doing that. This one in uh, the Canadian Rockies has 5,000 activation points uh, throughout Canada. Um, and the, the Gypsy Guide is a real comprehensive guide, um, uh, tour guide, if you like. Um, it's being used in adventure travel as well, um, with hiking and trekking and mountain biking and skiing, uh, we saw before as well. Um, so GPS is a, is, is a great navigational tool. Um, this was, a, uh, was an app um, called City Walks, and there is an Inverness uh, uh, City Walk, and that uses, uses GPS as well. Um, it's certainly worth, worth looking at. Um, it's a self-guided walking tour. It covers 400 cities worldwide. Um, it has detailed um, walking routes, 
Um, it has, uh, and, it, and you don't need 3G or internet access, it's all done through the GPS. So uh, there's no data plan, there's no, no uh, any roaming when you're traveling in, in foreign cities. And uh, the Inverness one, it has a, a landmark tour, it has a nightlife uh, Inverness tour, I'm not too sure about that one, what the nightlife in Inverness is like, uh, religious sites, shopping tour, um, and it has art galleries and museums. There are five art galleries and museums on the Inverness tour. And the Inverness Museum of Art, uh, uh, the Inverness Museum and Art Gallery, which I believe is represented today. I spoke to her earlier, she's still here. Hello, you're on it. And you are a must see on it as well. Um, so what happens with this is that you, you have your, your, um, your, your app and, uh, and you click on, uh, let's say Inverness Museum and Art Gallery. Um, and then it shows me where it is. Uh, it has a little radar, it has me and the gallery so that I can get there nice and quickly. I can then take a photograph and I can upload my own photographs to it. Um, but it also gives me points and uh, it, it's, as it's a trail, when I get to within 100, yard, 100 metres of Inverness Museum and Arts Gallery, uh, a button will light up and say, you are now there, press this button and you'll get a little 100 badges, whatever it is, 100 points or something like that. And with that I can get credits and I can get discounts and things like that. Um, have you seen have you seen the app, ladies? No. Okay. I've got it on my phone, so I'll show you it. I'll show you. I can also create my own tour as well, um, and I can stamp these different sites that I'm going around. Uh, I recommend you have a look at it. This is a. a I, I guess it's similar to the. Um, uh, was it Eddie Masonic? You spoke about, um, and this is uh, down in London, um, which is where I'm. I'm I'm from, um, and this was the Hackney, po uh, the Hackney podcast, which was uh, set up in 2008. And uh, podcasts are n a, a nice way, again, um, because they can be GPS activated. Um, but we spoke before about walking around, and I'm looking at this, and there's something over here, and I'm missing it because I'm looking at this, and there's something over here that I'm looking at, and then I have to scan and augment reality and things like that. And that's not really the experience that we want to have for our customers. Um, what podcasts allow you to do is to have that richness of what it is you're seeing, um, but have the stories um, in, in, in your ears talking about it. Um, Hackney, uh, I don't know if you know, was one of Britain's poorest places, but culturally it's probably one of Britain's richest places. It's an area of London uh, marked by its history, but also with the Olympics, it's now been completely um, um, regenerated, if you like. It's already immersive. Um, but it's also journalistically uh, inventive. There are lots of communities um, that are contributing to those podcasts. Um, and again, that's possibly something that we could think about doing in, in cooperatives um, and some of the trails. Certainly I've been involved um, with a company that's uh, a part of the Pictish Trail and I could imagine doing those sort of podcasts for the Pictish Trails um, that as you approach some of the stones in the different places that you could begin to hear some of the history about it and have some, some actors speaking about you know, how, how it was in, in back in the, in the pick times. Um, and I love this, it, you know, it uses geolocation software in your smartphone. The app knows where you are and therefore knows which story to play. Um, and Matt Hill, who was part of the team that developed um, the Hackney here, um, he, he said it, it whispers Hackney's history into your ear. And I quite like that. I think that really sums up what it was Hackney are trying to do. Um, and they've, you know, they've won a word, word, words for it. Um, but these are great. Uh, it's, it's, it's an app. We can't all start developing app. You know, we need to be able to download the app in the first place. Um, so we need to, uh, it needs to be promoted, possibly prior to travel or in places where you can have the Wi-Fi or the 3G connection so that you can actually have it. So that's, again, going back to the journey of the customer. Finally, I want to uh, talk about QR codes. Um, this is something that's been around for a long time, actually. Um, maybe I'm not quite seeing it in some of the, the, the tourism um, applications yet. Um, for you, those of you who don't know, QR codes are called, uh, QR is quick response, and it's a two-dimensional code that can be scanned by a smartphone, a camera, um, and it uh, can then automatically pull up text, photos, videos, music, or websites, or it can, pull up a, um, a restaurant's menu, for example, or your contact information. Um, QR code scans have increased by 300% uh, between 2010 and 2011, and they continue to rise. Um, the reason that QR codes are, are um, 
successful or of interest is that um, they can store up to over 7,000 numbers. And because of that additional storage capacity, you can com accommodate a whole range of different types of data. So you can do hyperlinks, which is you know, predominantly just going back to, to your website. But you can download an app using a QR code. You can send an SMS message. You can send an email. You can uh, get contact uh, information. So if I had one on my um, uh, business card, if you scanned it, it would go straight into your um, uh, contacts list or your calendar entry or something like that. Um, so that, uh, storing that type of hyperlink um, uh, presents some myriad of possibilities beyond just loading a web page, if you like. Um, so in stores, QR codes on price tags, you can get online reviews for products. Um, or you can go into TripAdvisor and see your reviews um, if, it, if it was in your um, reception area. Uh, in, in magazines for products, um, you could use a QR code to see how you use a product. It can have an instructional guide, a video guide, uh, maybe on, uh, on, on YouTube. I know estate agents that are using QR codes now on for sale signs. Uh, you can um, uh, click on the for sale sign or in the window and it will take you to a virtual tour of that home on your site as well. So QR codes are becoming uh, quite powerful. And they're so simple to make. I don't think people appreciate how you can just go on a website, put in a URL and, and they will give you a QR code. Um, so. Uh, QR code generators include um, Deliver, D-E-L-I-V-R, uh, QRStuff.com, um, and there's a, a, whole, a whole range of others. If you, if you Google uh, QR generators, you'll, you'll, you'll find one. Um, and most of them are free as well. They will just kick out a square that looks like that. Um, the thing with the QR code is it with a mobile phone you need a QR reader to be able to read it. So your customer has to do something and sometimes that not, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, that they then have, have a little bit of pain if you like. Um, I have one on my phone um, and I don't know how many, well how, oh, let's have a poll, how many people have got a QR reader on their, on their phone? Okay, so that's probably about a third of you. Okay. And because it's work, it's, you know, I've got to get a QR reader and then I've got to go and do this, this thing, if you like. Um, I think users have high expectations as to what content they want. I don't know if just going to your website is, uh, is enough. And I think that maybe when we're using QR codes, we need to reward the user with a discount or some sort of exclusive content or useful tips other than just a link to your U URL. Um, so for example, uh, if I have a QR code on my business card and you scan it and it means you goes into, you know, that's adding value to you because it's not wasting your time and it means you have to keep my card, if you like. Uh, it's a lot easier for, than you manually entering my contract record. So that's saving you some time. So I think we need to have a, have a, a think about the strategy behind it. Um, just, just one other thing while we're on QR codes is um, using it as a measurement and tracking tool. Um, some of these websites have, and we spoke about the importance of tracking, you know, how many people um, uh, what uh, uh, downloading your um, your QR code um, and what uh, type of devices they're using to um, uh, to read it as well. So there are certain analytics that you can do with QR codes. Um, Monmouthpedia went a bit crazy with QR codes. They have a thousand QR codes throughout their uh, their village. So this uh, was an idea that came through a TEDx talk in Bristol by a gentleman called John Cummings. Um, who was a, uh, an editor on Wikipedia. Everybody kn uh, knows what Wikipedia is? Okay. He was an editor on Wikipedia. Um, and somebody suggested that they do a whole town with QR codes. And that challenge was given to, to this guy, John Cummings, um, and his hometown was Monmouth. So he then went to Monmouth and he spoke to the local councillors uh, and he assembled a group of sort of ad hoc um, people. And in six months, uh, they managed to get the council to um, install a free town-wide Wi-Fi network. Um, and the, the entire town was just um, uh, bedecked with banners um, saying that Monmouth was going to be the first Wikipedia town in the world. Um, and Wikipedia has this great uh, um, project called uh, QRpedia. And QRpedia allows you to create QR codes for Wikipedia pages. 
Um, and that's a great thing. And it's a great thing for tourist businesses. Because all of a sudden you have the opportunity to update and have a community of people updating your Wikipedia pages. Um, and uh, volunteers to Monmouth contributed over 500 new articles in 25 different languages, as well as, uh, as videos as well. Um, the project has a, has a long list of partners, over 200 businesses are involved in it, several universities, nearly every school and community group in Monmouth was involved in this. Um, so yes, there's over, th over a thousand of these, and you know, they're on, they're, they're on ceramics, uh, and they're on signs, and so it's not like they're, they're gonna go away in a hurry. Uh, it wasn't done on, on a piece of paper and, and then laminated. Um, again, Google uh, Monmouthpedia and you can, and you can, you can see it. Um, uh, there's lots of news about it and, and actually it went a bit viral, um, uh, the Monmouth uh, achievement. Um, as of the 3rd of April last year, and this is the latest statistics that I had, um, they had 288 news articles in 21 different languages. Um, they had 143 um, improved articles that people that had gone onto Wikipedia and improved them. And they had over 800 new images uploaded as well from people that were, were going um, onto Wikipedia. Um, they had 400, more than 400,000 page views than the previous year. Uh, they reckon that the advertisement that they had globally, it was on NBC News, it was in the news in Australia, um, they reckon that it was equivalent to the value of a 2.1 million pound advertising spend uh, by, by doing that. So they're innovating. Uh, this is the QRpedia, and that, although we can't do it with our QR uh, readers, uh, that is one that I made up for Strathpeffer. So if you actually click on that, um, you go into the Strathpeffer um, Wikipedia page. So QR codes, there's a lot of um, uh, debate really whether QR codes are a fad, whether they're actually any good. Um, uh, this is a Guinness QR code um, uh, and it's on a beer glass and it was dreamed up by uh, BDO uh, in, in New York. And it's, li it's literally, it's clever because it's literally activated by the product. It won't work on an empty glass. It won't even work when you put lager in the glass. You pour the Guinness into the glass and the beer's black colour fills out the code. You scan the code with your smartphone and then it tweets about you're having the most wonderful pint in the world. It sends, it, it checks you into Foursquare. It downloads coupons for another pint of Guinness as well and promotions. And it invites your friends to join you. You know, I'm in the bar, come and join me. Um, and, it, and it can launch exclusive content and things like that. And so, you know, clever use of QR codes if you like. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. Okay. Finally, I wanted to move on to Pinterest, and this was something that I think <coughs> Rennie m mentioned a while ago. Um, Pinterest's uh, popularity has skyrocketed in recent months, and I do believe that now, after Facebook and Twitter, it is the number three most popular social networking. If you're not on it, you should seriously consider being on it um, as a tourism organisation. <laughs> because um, you're missing an opportunity of a lot of eyeballs. Um, and there's an emphasis on photo sharing, the sharing of photographs and sharing of images, which is a huge opportunity for companies like yourselves. Um, because as I'm pinning something, I see photographs of beautiful places and interesting attractions, and then I'll repin it. Uh, have a look at King's Dominion on Pinterest. Actually, it's the one that's there. Um, it's an amusement park in America, in Virginia. Um, and they, they pin great pictures of the rides and photographs of the park visitors having fun. Um, uh, but Pinterest now has a, a, has a business, um, and it's uh, a, a business.pinterest.com, um, where businesses can tell their stories, businesses can build their own communities, and they have a, a pin it button to share stuff from your website, uh, but you also have analytics which again is so important now when we're doing things that we know that, we're, that it's adding value to our business. Um, so we need to be measuring uh, what we're doing. Um, and has analytics to see what, what people are interested, what they're pinning, what they're interested in, and what they're not pinning. Um, if you want to look at a good case study for that, uh, it's uh, Jet Setter. Have I got it there? Oh no, that's the business, uh, the business link. Um, Jet Setter. 
So it's Pinterest.com floor says jet setter photo. It's got 4.2 million viewers, uh, followers, sorry. So certainly one of a case study or a model that's being effectively, effectively used. So really in summary, um, I guess I just wanted to go through, um, that was one of the nicest photos, it hasn't really come out because it's too big, but that's one of the nicest photographs of Strathpeth that, that, that I found. Um, I think when we're talking about digital, we need to think strategically. We don't want to do it ad hoc. Digital stuff takes time, it takes money, it's hard work, same as social, you know, social media, spending time on Facebook. You know, your business isn't about being on Facebook, your business is providing a service to, to customers that want to have a quality service, they want to think they're getting value for money, they want to be engaged with. So it needs to be strategic. You need to make a, a top level decision whether this is stuff you want to be involved in and at what level and how it's going to complement your business as well because digital is only part of the story. It is only part of the story. If you are looking at digital content, it used to be location, 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 didn't it? In businesses and things like that. Online, it's content, content, content. It's got to be engaging. It's got to be relevant. And the only people that you can read that really can tell you whether or not that's true is your customers. Um, so make it interesting, make it fun, make it engaging. Um, and listen to your customers. I think that goes on everyone. But I think there's real opportunities in, in, in the Highlands um, and, uh, and, the, and the area to, to collaborate with one another and to partner um, with one another in some of these areas and to, to learn from each other, particularly when um, uh, the businesses are complementary. Uh, and I think that, uh, that certainly that's something that Highlands Islands Enterprise Interface um, can en and, and uh, uh, Cooperative Scotland can help to, to start to do that in some of the um, management organisations. Um, use some of these existing tools that we've been talking about. Certainly, Rene um, mentioned a few of them before. Um, go on, explore them, see if they fit with your business, see if they're easy to use, see if you like them, see if they, you know, they feel right um, and, uh, and can add value to your business. But don't be afraid to experiment and innovate. You know, that's what the people at Hackney here did. Um, that's what some of the people on Pinterest are trying to do. That's what um, Guinness, although they've got millions of pounds, that's what they're trying to do. And I think that sometimes... Um, we lack, um, we become a little bit scared uh, in Scotland to try some of these uh, innovations. Um, and, and I think that um, innovation and experimentation should be you know, supported and recognised um, in, this, in this area. And it was an afterthought, but, um, and it was mentioned again by Renan, and I apologise, but this mobile payment stuff, it's coming, without a doubt. I've, I've no doubts in my mind in five years' time um, w w less and less of us will be having credit cards. I heard a program on Radio 2 yesterday about it, um, and uh, more and more payments will be made through mobile. Uh, so it's coming, so I would keep abreast of that because um, your customers are going to be de demanding it, and they won't be having their visas and credit cards in five years' time. And so I think, I think we really need to keep a very close eye uh, on that. Um, but I didn't want to, it to take up too much of my presentation. Um, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. My name's uh, Chris Mull. That is a, uh, uh, again, <laughs> you can't get it down. You can get it from here. But that's my LinkedIn um, uh, QR code. Um, I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, um, Stuart Massey, uh, who's a research fellow from Robert Gordon University. Uh, and he's going to talk about a project that is exploring um, delivering content to rural sites um, that don't have any 3G connectivity. Um, if you have any questions or you want, um, I think we're going to have a panel discussion, but please feel free, um, please email me um, at uh, that email address and I'll be happy to talk to any of you. Okay, thanks very much.